Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the OCHAR Zoom. Uh, we have Bill Gifford from the uh, attorney firm Martin and Gifford in, where are you, in Winston-Salem? Winston-Salem, exactly. <laughs> but he's also, whenever you uh, do the, um, when you have a question for the uh, legal hotline, Bill or someone on his in his team are the ones that answer that. So we are really happy to have Bill here today. Uh, and he's going to go over some of the various new forms. There were a lot of, um, well, I thought there was a lot of changes this year. So um, he will hit the highlights of that. So thanks, Bill. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, welcome everybody uh, to this presentation. Uh, I know it was scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes. I told Steve and Ashley uh, that I think I can do this in 30 minutes, but uh, maybe it'll be 45. I'll, but uh, I, do, I do want everybody to know that if you've got questions as you go along, I put them in the chat box. Hopefully somebody's gonna be monitoring it. I'm not very good at trying to monitor stuff, uh, but I welcome any questions. The whole, this is all, uh, for y'all's benefit. And um, there are some changes. There are not a, a ton of them that are significant, but, um, but, but the ones that are significant, uh, I want you all to understand them. Um, so just a few things, um, you know, I am in Winston-Salem. Our law firm, Martin and Gifford, has represented the Association of Realtors for um, 16 years now. Uh, among the things that we do is handle the legal hotline. If you have any questions about these new forms, uh, the legal hotline is a, is a benefit of membership. There's no additional cost. Um, you can call us by calling the NC Realtors phone number or you can email us questions. And the email address for the hotline is what you might expect it to be. It's uh, legalhotline at ncrealtors.org. Um, and so, you know, welcome those questions too. Um, the idea, um, so as probably most of you know, or maybe all of you know, uh, forms are updated every year, effective on July 1. And the new forms are available. They should be available in zip forms now. They should be available in dot loop. Um, they're available on the, on the NC Realtors website. Uh, forms policy says that there's a 60 day grace period. So for uh, the months of July and August, it's perfectly permissible to use the older versions of the forms, uh, but you can also use the new versions. And then starting on September 1, uh, it would violate forms policy to use the older versions. And so it gives you an, you know, an opportunity to kind of get up to speed on these new forms. Um, I am today, I'm gonna focus on the changes to two forms, really primarily the forms that people use the most often um, and that would be the offer to purchase and contract and the listing agreement. And also I'm gonna talk about the buyer agency agreement too. I know y'all are buyer agents too. Um, there are very few changes to that agreement. Um, uh, there are a total of uh, 31 forms that had some kind of change this year, but, but a lot of those changes are just formatting or very minor. And uh, before you start taking notes on everything that I'm gonna to talk to you about, all of this information is available on the NC Realtors website. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen and just show you how to get to the information that I'm about to share with you. And um, hopefully you won't all sign off of the Zoom meeting once I show you how to do this. But uh, all right, let me share my screen. You're muted, Bill. Okay, sorry. There you go. Was I muted there for yeah. a sec? Okay. Yep. Um, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, this is the NC Realtors website, ncrealtors.org. And to get to the information I'm talking about, you've got to sign in. Uh, the sign in button is right here on the upper right hand side. And when you do that, uh, you get an opportunity to sign in username and there's my, my nerds number and log, put in your password and you hit the login button. And this takes you to the member side of the realtor website. And when you get to this site, you, there are gonna be these um, 
links or buttons up in the top right hand corner. And the one you want to click on to get to this is Q&A. And when you go to Q&A, you get all these different categories that you can look for Q&As. And the one that we're going to go to is forms. Let me try that again. And when you click on forms, there are several different things you can look at. And the first one there is summary of forms changes. You click on that, you get you see some of the summary of forms changes going back to 2017. The one that we want is July of 2021, the residential forms changes. And if you click on that, I guess a PDF comes up down here and you can open. And here are all the summary of forms changes. And one of the things that's kind of nice about this is um, here, if you scroll down, here are all the changes to the offer to purchase and contract. And they're all described here. But not only that, but this is a, a link. And if you click on this link, it'll actually show you sort of the, uh, the changes highlighted. Um, so this is all really helpful stuff. And um, so uh, all this information is available for you right on, on the website. So I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. And I'm you still hear me, I hope, I'm not yeah. muted. Very good. Very good, all right. So let me talk about, um, let me start with the offer to purchase and contract. That is, you know, the form that people use the most often, obviously. Um, there are five basic significant changes to that form this year that I, that I like to talk about. Uh, there's one relating to the delay in settlement provision, which has been changed. There are a number of changes relating to due diligence fee. Um, there are several changes throughout the contract relating to special assessments. Um, there's a section, there's always been a section about where a buyer makes a representation about how they're going to finance the transaction, how they're going to pay for the home. There's some changes there. And finally, there's a new remedies paragraph, brand new paragraph, it's paragraph 23 of the contract. So I'm going to talk about that as well. So first, the delay in settlement. Um, just a little bit of background on the delay of settlement provision. That, that section was added to the contract back in in 2008. Um, and uh, it, was, it was added to add some clarity to how long a party has to wait uh, if the other party is failing to complete settlement by the settlement date. You know, if you looked at our contract, you know that there are plenty of dates in our contract where it says time is of the essence. But we've never made the settlement date time is of the essence. And why is that? Because sometimes things just happen um, and you just can't get the, you can't get closing settlement done on the settlement date. And it can be a variety of things. And so we never wanted to make time is of the essence and allow one party to terminate if something really unexpected came up and prevented the parties from, from, um, from settle, getting to settlement on the date they've selected. Um, but it was never our intention to give parties the automatic right to delay settlement. And, um, and what we found is over the years that parties were abusing it. And so initially back in 2008, I think there was a 30 day delay in settlement. The parties were given as much as 30 days to delay settlement. And I think many years ago, we, we reduced that from 30 days to 14 days. But even the 14 day period was being abused. And it was, you know, parties were, you know, if they wanted to make their offer look good, they would say, well, um, we'll, we'll do settlement on such and such a date. But they never really intended to, to go to settlement that day. They knew they had 14 days and they could claim that they were acting in good faith and they could get the extra time. Um, and other times, um, you know, they, maybe they never intended initially to, uh, to not settle on the settlement date, but, but something, you know, just was inconvenient for them. Uh, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to take a vacation. I don't know what. And, uh, and so they were using it for matters of convenience and, and sellers really were the ones that were getting um, in, you know, it was really a problem because sometimes sellers were moving out of their home 
Uh, they were they had another transaction that they were intending to close. And, and all of a sudden at the very last minute, buyers were saying we need additional time. And it was very difficult for sellers to, to say, well, I don't think you're acting, you buyer are acting in good faith. I don't think you really have the basis to delay settlement. And so it was really um, risky for sellers to terminate a contract based on buyer's failure to close on the settlement date. So to try to rein this in, we've done two things. Number one, and the most important is we've reduced the delay in settlement per period from 14 days to seven days. Um, you know, if so, I guess if anybody's gonna be inconvenienced, at least they won't be inconvenienced for as long a period of time. Um, the other thing is we've changed the language in the agreement. Now it used to always be that in order to get um, a delay in settlement, there were, there were certain things. It says uh, the, the old agreement said, if a party is unable to complete settlement, but intends to complete the transaction and is acting in good faith and with reasonable diligence, then they shall give as much notice as possible and they'll be entitled to 14 days. But it began with the words, if a party is unable to complete settlement. We've changed those words to read, it is not possible for that party to complete settlement. Um, the idea there is to, to make it even more clear that it, this is not for the convenience of the parties. It's only if it's truly not possible. Um, and I'm not sure that's, you know, unable and not possible. Those, that change of wording is not all that dramatic. But the idea here is this is not, this delay in settlement is not intended to be for the convenience of the parties. Um, it's intended to, to clarify that a delay is only available if there's a true need. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Um, the, second, the second change in the, in the contract has to do with the due diligence fee. Um, the old version of the contract in paragraph 1D talked about for certain things for the initial earnest money deposit, exactly how it was gonna be paid. There were check boxes for cash, personal check, official bank check, wire transfer, electronic transfer. But for the due diligence fee, there was never any specificity as to how that was gonna be paid. And increasingly, especially I think with younger buyers, uh, people wanted to pay their due diligence fee and everything else using things like uh, Venmo. And a lot of sellers uh, don't even have a Venmo account. And if a due, and if a fee, I think the way Venmo works, if you wanna make your payment using Venmo, there's no fee as long as you don't care if your fee is received immediately. But if you wanna receive right away and like direct deposit that day, there's a fee associated with it. And sellers didn't wanna pay it. And they, there was just no clarity as to whether or not the seller had to accept fees that way and who was gonna pay the fees and did the seller has to open an account and uh, so what we've done is we've changed, we've added language to the new form for the due diligence fee, where you check a box saying, is it going to be by cash, by personal check, by official bank check, by wire transfer, or electric electronic transfer? And if it's electronic transfer, you have to specify the payment service. And then there are also some added language saying, well, okay, if you're going to pay by electronic transfer, there's now language that says the seller agrees to cooperate with the buyer in affecting that transfer, including establishing the any necessary account and providing the necessary information to the buyer. But if there are any fees associated with an electronic transfer, the contract now makes it clear that the buyer is the one that has to pay those fees. So it's just a lot more specificity in terms of the manner in which a due diligence fee is paid. Um, another change, and one that's kind of near and dear to my heart is, you know, it was always uh, the intention of our contract that if, if the parties enter into a contract and the buyer agrees to pay a due diligence fee, they just can't change their mind and not be obligated to pay the due diligence fee. But increasingly, especially in the last year when the amount of the due diligence fees have gone up and there are now often very substantial, you have a situation where buyers get cold feet like almost immediately the next day 
Um, the contract's effective, but they say, well, you know, we're, we don't really want to proceed. They haven't paid their due diligence fee. You know, the contract, the language of the old contract said that if there was a breach of contract by the, by the buyer, the seller's remedy was they could get the earnest money deposit and they could retain the due diligence fee. Well, I've had a personal experience where I had a judge where, where I had represented a seller who sued for the due diligence fee. So, well, how can a seller retain something that they've never received? Well, we wanted to clarify that, that, a, that a seller's remedy when a buyer doesn't pay a due diligence fee is not only the earnest money deposit, but also the due diligence fee. And so the language of the contract has been clarified. Uh, I would say this is not a change in the contract. It's just a clarification of what we've always thought was the case to make it crystal clear that if a buyer you know, agrees to pay a due diligence fee and doesn't pay it, that's a breach of contract and the, and the seller is entitled to get that money, the earnest money deposit, and if they have to go to court, they get reasonable attorney fees. Um, obviously, if the buyer pays the due diligence fee, uh, they have the right then to terminate the contract during the due diligence period. Um, an another thing that's been changed in the contract is what, you know, some, a lot of times when these buyers got cold feet and they didn't pay their due diligence fee, they still thought they had the right to terminate the contract during the due diligence fee. We have now made it very clear, and this is in paragraph 4G of the contract. And I, let me read this language to you, if I can find it. We, you know, the language makes it clear that if the, if the buyer doesn't pay a due diligence fee that they've agreed to pay, they do not have the right to terminate, the, to, to terminate and get their earnest money deposit back. So paragraph 4G, which is entitled buyer's right to terminate, it now says, provided that buyer has delivered any agreed upon due diligence fee, buyer shall have the right to terminate the contract for any reason or no reason by delivering notice, by delivering to sell written notice of termination. So the contract is now crystal clear. You know, if the, buy, if the contract says the buyer agrees to pay a due diligence fee, if they don't fail, to, if they don't pay that due diligence fee, they do not have the right to terminate the contract during the due diligence period and get their earnest money deposit back. You know, basically all this is saying is a contract is a contract. If you agree to something in a contract, you're bound by it. Uh, if you agree to pay a due diligence fee, if you're a buyer, you can't change your mind. There's no three-day right of rescission. It's an absolute obligation. Um, you know, why do we make these changes? You know, like I say, we've had uh, we get a lot of calls on our legal hotline about this, uh, about buyers uh, entering into contracts and changing their mind. And we hope that, that these changes really discourage buyers from doing that going forward. I, you know, if a buyer does that going forward and a seller sues, I don't think there's any chance that a judge will have any question about what the seller's rights are. Okay, let me talk about special assessments. Um, you know, there's always been uh, definitions, and there still is, of uh, two types of special assessments, proposed special assessments, confirmed special assessments. What's the difference? The difference is, has the special assessment been approved? And special assessments come in two flavors. You know, either they're by a municipality, um, maybe, or, or they're by a, a homeowners association, property owners association. Um, and in both cases, uh, assessments can be under consideration. Um, and if they're under consideration, but they haven't been approved, you know, that's a proposed special assessment. If, they're, if they've been actually a formally approved, that is a, a confirmed special assessment. Well, the contract used to uh, require the seller to make a representation about whether or not there were confirmed or proposed special assessments. Well, the fact of the matter is, there was a, you know, a blank space where they would say, um, if any, please specify. And, and, and lots of agents would, in, when they were asked about proposed special assessments, would say none or none known, if any, um, 
a buyer to pay, or excuse me, seller to pay, seller to pay, buyers would put that in their offer. Well, the problem with doing that is under the language of the contract, proposed special assessments were buyer obligations, but the buyers were inserting language that say, if there were any, that they were seller obligations to pay and it created an ambiguity in the contract. And, and so, you know, what we decided to do, what the forms committee decided to do, I, it wasn't me, I'm not on that committee. Uh, they eliminated that representation altogether. Um, so not only does it eliminate ambiguity, the, the fact of the matter was lots of sellers had no idea if in a homeowners association or maybe their local municipality had a special assessment under consideration. And by, by representing that there were none, uh, perhaps buyers were not investigating the existence of special assessments fully. Um, so another thing that we've done in the contract is, you know, there's a laundry list in paragraph four of what buyers should consider doing during the due diligence period. Uh, what we've done is we've added a new subparagraph in paragraph four. And this is in paragraph 4B, which talks about property investigation. And 4B has, you know, a lot of subparagraphs. And so we've added a new one, 4B Roman numeral X, 10. And it's entitled Special Assessments, Investigation of the Existence of Special Assessments that may be under consideration by a governmental authority or an owner's association. And so this is just reminding buyers that this is something that's worth looking into. Now, the, fact, the existence of special assessments is still a material fact. And if a seller knows about them and um, they can't, you know, they should disclose it. You know, if a listing agent knows about it and or should know about it, um, they need to disclose it. The, the, there's no change in uh, the obligation to disclose material facts. Uh, what we're just eliminating is, is the representation that, that sellers were making in the past, which were inherently unreliable, created ambiguity. Um, um, so um, that's a change that uh, we think is a good one. Let me think if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the obligation, who pays them, that hasn't changed at all. Proposed special assessments remain the obligation uh, proposed, uh, proposed remain the obligation of buyer, confirmed re re remain the obligation of the seller, uh, and, and they remain the obligation of the seller to be paid at closing, whether or not the special assessments would otherwise be paid sometime after settlement, after closing. So sometimes a, um, and a special assessment might be approved by homeowners association to be paid in, in installments over, let's say three years. You gotta pay $1,000 a year for the next three years. Well, the, um, uh, you know, if, if only one installment had already become due and there were two more that were gonna come due in the future, those installments have to be paid at closing by the seller um, as long as the amount of those special assessments could be determined uh, or estimated with reasonable certainty. Okay, change number four, the buyer representation regarding uh, financing. Uh, really, the changes mostly have been regarding formatting. Um, uh, there was some information that's been deleted. Like it used to be the buyer was making representations about the term of their loan, interest rate of their loan. That's not something that sellers need to know. And so it was eliminated. What, buy, what sellers want to know is, you know, are you paying cash? Or are you financing it? And if you're financing it, are you financing it with a, a conventional loan? Is it an FHA or VA loan? We've added a checkbox for USDA loans, which maybe in Orange and Chatham County is something that you guys see um, from time to time. You know, is there a second mortgage loan? Um, we've eliminated the checkbox for um, down payment assistance program. There were some concerns about that. Um, from a fair housing standpoint, whether or not sellers might have been refusing to accept any offer where that checkbox where that checkbox was checked, so we've eliminated that checkbox altogether. Um, we've added a note at the end of the paragraph 
uh, that if the if the buyer, after entering into the contract, makes a change in the manner in which they're financing the transaction, that fact has to be disclosed. Um, there's no, you know, we get a lot of questions on the hotline. Can the buyer change their form of financing? And the answer is they can. They are not prohibited from making a change. Uh, what they what the representation that's that's been in the contract for the last several years and continues to be is what the buyer's intention is with respect to their form of financing. Um, and, you know, there's always, you know, a lot of times, buyer, you know, there's a lot of suspicion on sellers' parts where buyers say they're going to pay cash and in order to get their offer accepted, and then they, they decide to go get a loan. You know, what we've told listing agents is if a buyer represents that they're paying cash, make them request, you know, you, you're entitled to request that they provide you with documentation showing you that they've got the ability to pay cash. That is a reasonable thing uh, to request. And if they do request, if they do have the financial ability to, to pay cash and they decide to obtain financing, you know, it shouldn't be any of the concern of the seller. Um, you know, another question that comes up a lot is what if they, what if the, if the buyer decides to change to FHA VA financing even though they've represented, let's say they're going to pay cash or they're going to be, do a conventional. Well, they can try to make that change. The problem that buyers have in that circumstance is VA and, and FHA loans require that VA and FHA addendum to be signed. And the reality is if, if a buyer changes to that form of financing, they're going to need the seller to sign that addendum. And there is no obligation on the seller's part to sign an addendum to a contract once the parties are under contract. You know, they can, the buyer can ask the seller to make, to sign an addendum, but there's no, there's no obligation on the seller to do so. So, you know, buyers shouldn't assume that they can represent one, one type of financing with the understanding, with the, uh, you know, intention to change to, to VA and FHA later because they may not be able to get that done. Uh, final change on the, uh, on the contract, the remedies section, in the old version of the contract, remedies, the party's remedies were in various places throughout the contract. And, and primarily where they were was in the definition of earnest money deposit. Uh, in paragraph, I guess it was the old contract, it was paragraph one. Where am I looking? I think it was one D maybe. Um, it was in the definition section of the contract which was not a place where most party, most people would look for it. Um, so what we've just, we really haven't changed substantively. It was paragraph 1E was the definition of earnest money deposit, which is where it showed what the buyer's remedies were and what the seller's remedies were. Um, it, you know, buyer's remedies, if the seller breached, seller's remedy if buyer breached. So what we've done is we've, we've taken all of the remedies provisions of the contract, not really changed them, but put them all in uh, paragraph 23 of the contract. Um, in a place where I think people will find, you know, will get used to, to seeing them. You know, one other thing that we've done, we've, we've actually added a statutory reference in that section paragraph. It's a North Carolina general statute chapter six, section 21.2. And this is an attorney fee statute. And I think what agents need to know is that generally speaking in North Carolina, attorney's fees are not available to the prevailing party. And they're only, they can only be available in certain circumstances and they can be available if the parties have a contract that has an evidence of indebtedness. And if they, if you have a contract that calls for an, that, that constitutes an evidence of indebtedness and the parties agree to an attorney fee provision, those provisions will be enforced. And so we've always taken the position that our contract does create an indebtedness on the part of the buyer. And so therefore attorney fee provisions should be enforceable so we've referenced the statute. Now, ultimately, whether a judge awards attorney fees is gonna be up to the judge. You know, we can't dictate what the judge does. And so that's why we've said in, this, in paragraph 23 that the attorney's, fees, the attorney's fees will be recoverable to the extent permitted under the statute. It's gonna be up to the judge to decide whether the attorney's fees are in fact recoverable. Um, so those are the changes I wanted to talk about. I realize I'm taking a lot of time, almost half an hour on this form. But uh, another thing that I just, a, 
another thing that I think is a good change to the par to the contract is in paragraph three, personal property. Um, it used to say that the following personal property shall be transferred to buyer at closing. And believe it or not, we've had this situation come up a bunch where let's say there's a really nice refrigerator in the, in the house. It's a sub-zero. The, the listing agent's taken a picture of the kitchen. It shows the sub-zero refrigerator. And the buyer comes in, sees the house, sees the nice sub-zero refrigerator and wants it. And so they put in the contract that the refrigerator in paragraph three, they put in refrigerator with the assumption that the refrigerator that's gonna convey is that really nice sub-zero refrigerator. Well, they get to, they do their final walkthrough before closing and they realize that the buyer, excuse me, the seller has taken that nice sub-zero refrigerator out and has put in this used GE refrigerator. You know? um, they got it at a secondhand store. And, and, and the contract just says refrigerator. Well, I'm not sure that these exact facts have come up, but something similar to this, you know, where appliances have been changed out. And so we wanted to make it clear that's not kosher. So now paragraph three reads the following personal property present on the property on the date of the offer shall be transferred at closing at no value. So if the buyer sees the sub zero and makes an offer and puts it in a refrigerator, that's the, that's the personal property that conveys the closing. Um, and, and I think actually there's some uh, language about uh, present at the property closing also added in, uh, in paragraph 2B uh, where they specify uh, items that will be considered fixtures. Um, so that's it on the offer to purchase. On the, uh, I'm gonna quickly go through the listing agreement. The, the, the significant changes are in paragraphs nine through 12. Uh, paragraph nine, what we've done is we've added a, um, a note about love letters, buyer letters. Um, you know, I, this is just one of the many things that people are doing to try to make buyers offers look better. Uh, you know, letters saying, you know, this house would be perfect for my family. We love the neighborhood. My kids love a great time. Well, you know, these letters can, can, um, uh, can lead to fair housing uh, complaints. People saying, well, you know, you, you refused to, or you, you sold the house based on familial status. Who knows what, you know, this house is next to my church. Uh, you know, maybe it's based on religion. These create fair housing problems. We want to warn uh, parties, uh, sellers, um, that, uh, that these love letters are problematic. Uh, and should, and, you know, maybe caution should be used about... Uh, about using them. Paragraph 10, the marketing paragraph, it used to be the default provision was marketing would begin on the effective date of the agreement. And, but if the parties wanted to delay uh, marketing that they would, they would check a box and they would put in the delayed marketing date. The, the listing agreement has been changed. There is no default now. Now the, 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 the seller and the listing agent have to agree when marketing will begin. And if they wanna, you know, if it's gonna be on the effective date, you can put in the date that the, that the uh, listing agreement is signed or you can put in a delayed date. Um, uh, there's also a requirement now that, that the, the seller is going to have to make an election between public marketing and office exclusive. Um, and if, uh, if public marketing is selected uh, coming soon, if, if, if they elect coming soon marketing, you're gonna have to fill in a date when the coming soon will be changed to active status. Um, and we've also added, if they elect um, office exclusive, we've added language, um, I believe talking about the, um, and this may have been in there, Oh, making it clear that that if you if you if you select office exclusive, that public marketing is absolutely prohibited um, if that office exclusive option is selected, um, and that if you if you start out with office exclusive and you decide you want to go to public marketing, you're actually going to have to amend the listing agreement in order to in order to do that. 
Uh, paragraph 11 has to do with the escrow um, handling of escrow money and uh, or earnest, excuse me, earnest money. And the, the assumption was in the old days that, that most firms uh, had trust accounts and would handle less uh, earnest money. Uh, now, you know, that, that is um, frequently now firms are not, uh, don't have trust accounts. And so uh, earnest money is more and more often being handled by, by closing firms. And so now there's a, uh, uh, a checkbox. Let's see. So uh, the new version, the listing agent will need to check the appropriate box to indicate whether the firm maintains a trust account. And that if not, that the escrow agent was going to be identified in the sales contract. And then finally, paragraph 12, this is sort of a formatting change. These were uh, uh, seller representations. And a lot of the seller representations in the past were based on actual knowledge. Some were based on to the best of the seller's knowledge. So what we've done now in paragraph 12 is we reorganized that and, and put all of the things that are on actual knowledge in, 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 one, part of the, in one part of paragraph 12 and things that are only to the best of the seller's knowledge in a separate, in a separate section. Uh, the buyer agency agreement, uh, really just three changes to mention. Um, one, if the, um, we've added a note, um, if the buyer, in, in, at the very beginning of the form, saying if the buyer is a corporation, limited liability trust, limited liability company trust or other legal entity, the entity should be named as a buyer. And the, it is the duly authorized officer, manager, trustee, or other legal representative who should sign the agreement. And just, um, you know, if property is being held in trust, it's not the beneficiary of the trust. Uh, that's, the, that's the party. Uh, it's, it's the trustee, not the beneficiary. Um, Here's another change in the buyer agency agreement, which I think is really helpful. In paragraph 4C, uh, we've talked about um, when buyer, when compensation is earned, and you know, if we've always said if it's during the term of the agreement, uh, the buyer enters into an agreement to purchase property, whether or not the firm is involved in it, the, the agent is entitled to compensation. And we then we've also said that if within a certain period of time after uh, the term of the agency agreement expires, um, the, the buyer acquires property that's introduced to the buyer during, uh, during the term of the agreement. In other words, they, you know, they let the, the agency ex agreement expire and then they buy property that the agent has introduced to them, compensation is still owed. And we've always referred to that period of time as the protection period. You can fill in the number of days, 30 days, 60 days, 180 days. But we never actually use the phrase protection period. We've, we've actually added the words protection period to paragraph 4C2 of the agreement. And that's really helpful because in paragraph 720, when we talk about termination of agency agreements, we've said, well, we're going to terminate the agency, but, but the agent still has the, whatever rights they have under the quote protection period. Well, it's, it's great to refer to protection period, but we've, we, we've referred to it as if it was a defined term, but we actually never had the defined term in the agency agreement. Well, now we do. In paragraph 4C2, it's actually there. And then the only, the third change in the buyer agency agreement has to do with uh, these love letters. Similar to the listing agreement, we've added a warning uh, after paragraph eight about the, um, the risks of buyers sending love letters. Um, so those are those changes. Just a few other things that I wanted to mention about other forms. Um, there have been some forms that where there have been name changes and, and you know, you wouldn't think name changes are that important, but uh, all of the termination forms have been, have been changed. Uh, we've always had a group of forms uh, the 350, 350, 351, 352, 353, which were unilateral termination forms. Um, they were forms to be used when one party 
had a right unilaterally to terminate a contract. They didn't need the agreement of the other party. And they were all referred to the names of these forms was unilateral termination forms. And then we had a couple of other forms in the 390s um, that were uh, there were termination agreement, agreements where you actually required both parties to agree. So for example, you know, a buyer wants to terminate a contract after the due diligence period is over. Well, they don't have necessarily, they don't have the right to terminate a contract necessarily after the due diligence period is over, but the parties may agree to terminate. And so you would use a mutual termination agreement. Well, the names of all these forms either began with the word unilateral or they began with the word mutual. And when, people, when agents were looking for these forms in a forms library, they didn't necessarily know where to look. We've now changed the names of all of these forms to begin with the word termination. So if you're looking for these forms, you're gonna easily be able to find them. And the hope is that when you find them, they're all gonna be grouped together and you're gonna find the right one. And all I can do is, is tell you, I, I think it's the most common question we get on the hotline has to do with terminating contracts and how to properly do it. And you know, I can tell you that one of the biggest things that happens is buyers who have the absolute right to terminate a contract during the due, due diligence period, instead of terminating one of the unilateral termination forms, they send a mutual termination form to the listing agent and ask the seller to sign it. And it, all that is, if you send a mutual termination form, it's an, you're offering to terminate the contract. You're not necessarily terminating it. Maybe you are, but it, you're leaving the door open. And I think a lot of you might be thinking, well, the, even the unilateral forms have a second page where the seller can sign, and they do, because you know it's for release of earnest money deposit, and you want the seller maybe to agree to, to release it. But even if the seller has, there's a place for the seller to sign the unilateral, or the, the other party to sign the unilateral termination forms, that signature is not a required signature on the unilateral forms. Uh, if a party has the right to terminate, they have the right to terminate whether or not the other party signs it. And so hopefully the name change will lead to less confusion and, and, and agents finding the right form. Um, another little group of, of, form, of name changes have to do with um, Forms 220 and, and Form 770. Form 220 uh, is a form if you're an agent, a buyer agent, and, and let's say you want to make an offer on a property, but you're, it, the listing, you're not in the MLS where the property is listed. In order for you to be compensated, you need an agreement with that agent in order to be compensated. Or let's say there's certain compensation that's being offered in the MLS, but you, you want to get more. They're only offering you know, X percent and you want Y percent. If you want to arrange compensation other than what's being offered in the MLS, you need an agreement with the listing agent. Well, the form that we've always had for doing that is Form 220, which the name of that form used to be Confirmation of Agency Relationship Appointment and Compensation. And if you were looking for that form in our forms library, you might not find it. Well, we've changed the name of that form to be confirmation of compensation, agency and appointment and, and making it a lot easier to find because that's what it is. It's a compensation agreement. The form is set up to be signed by listing agents and buyer agents and, and their guidelines for using it, Form 220G. And so hopefully just by changing the name of it, we're gonna make it easier to find. And let me tell you why it was, there was even more confusion because until now there was a form called confirm confirmation of compensation <laughs> and it was form 770 and it sounds like it was a compensation agreement but it never was form 770 was never a compensation agreement it was a disclosure form it was a form for agents to use to disclose to their clients the compensation that they expected to receive but it was called confirmation of compensation so the name of that form has been changed to disclosure of compensation. And if you look at that form, you'll see it's not even set up to be signed by a listing agent and a buyer agent. It's, it's set up to be signed by 
a firm and a client. It's a firm disclosing something and a client acknowledging that disclosure. And so I think these name changes will uh, eliminate um, a lot of confusion um, about, about what forms to use. Um, I, I think that's really all I've got. So uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be happy to field them if there are. I haven't been looking in the chat box. You know, uh, this must be a really smart group because um, there doesn't appear to be any questions so far. Uh, if anyone wants to type something in real quick. Or, or even unmute them, I, you know, I'd be happy to. Oh, I'd uh, hate to do that. that okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I asked um, um, John, John did it last week, um, and I'm curious uh, your opinion on if buyer and seller agree to a wire. Um, how are we going to decide how we're going to, you know, we as broker in charges we caution our agents and you know about getting involved in wiring instructions. Right. Um, yeah, it's really dangerous. And, you know, we've, we've put these wire transfer uh, cautions all over the contracts and, um, and in our listing agreement, all of our agency agreements. And, you know, I haven't heard a lot about, about, uh, about uh, wire, wire transfers being misdirected lately. I started, I, you know, we started hearing about this years, several years ago. Um, I will tell you this, uh, agents should not be involved in those communications. They should not be giving directions to their, their clients about wire transfers. Uh, if, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure how John answered that question. I, I, would, I would just um, suggest perhaps that the parties actually communicate directly with each other about any any type of wiring instructions and leave the agents out of it completely. Yeah, that couldn't go bad at all. Buyer and yeah. sellers talking. <laughs> well, about you know about a limited thing, but uh, you know I just you know I just, just you because you know the reality is that even if the agents aren't giving the instructions, it turns out in some of the cases because I've actually represented agents who've been sued over this. And the question sometimes comes up, well, how did these hackers um, find out the email addresses of people to send them fraudulent wiring instructions? And sometimes the allegation is that they were able to view the communications through the agent's email system. Wow. And so I just don't think that the agents want to be a party to these kinds of wiring instructions at all. Um, and I, and I, you know, like for example, you know, if it, no, normally the wiring instructions are, we're talking about closings and it's from the, you know, we tell them to deal directly with the closing attorney and to confirm with the closing attorney that the wiring instructions are legitimate. And, uh, you know, here, I think, you know, I would say if you're going to, if, if somebody wants a wire, you should, you know, get the wiring instructions from from that party, and then make make a phone call or something to confirm that the email that you've received that those wiring instructions are legitimate before actually sending a wire. Okay. All right. Does this come up often, Steve? I don't know. Well, it's it's you know it's it's gonna now because we that's a box on you know right on the due diligence right so yeah. Um, you know, and, when, and you got the one day thing, you got, you got buyers are out of town. I mean, sometimes it's very difficult, you know, it's FedEx or. Uh... Right. So we're, you know, and our firm is trying to decide how we're going to handle that too. Um, yeah. And it could be such that, you know, if it gets to be just a crazy amount of money, it's, it's just going to have to be a check. Um, they're just going to have to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I think there's just a lot of risk, and you know, I, I mean, sometimes uh, if firms, I don't know, they, they're used to the, these uh, E and O carriers were providing these wire transfer uh, endorsements, and I don't know if uh, if they're still doing that, and if firms are getting those endorsements, obviously, if you 
if you've got um, if you feel like you've got insurance coverage and you feel like you've got a very secure email system, you know that might impact on exactly how much you're willing to get involved on on this. But you know there is a lot of risk because the money, you know, the dollar amounts are huge, and so the risk is commensurate with that. Someone talked about you know involving the closing attorney if they have the ability to send encrypt, encrypted um, emails, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure closing attorneys are going to want to do that. Yeah, and with due diligence money, you know, that it doesn't generally go to uh, yeah to a closing attorney anyway. So, so well, this is a couple of couple of there uh, are there's questions. a couple of questions now. Um, Okay. Does the appraisal have to be completed in the due diligence period for the buyer to be able to get out of the contract for property not appraising? Well, um, it really depends on if you've got a VA or FHA addendum. You know, it, there is no appraisal contingency. There's no financing contingency in the contract. You know, if a buyer, uh, it's one, you know, wants to back out if the property doesn't appraise, they they have to, yeah, the only, the, their only right to do so is during the due diligence period. Uh, the FHA VA addendum says there can't be a penalty to the buyer if the property doesn't appraise. And so if the property doesn't appraise, they, they, uh, they can get their earnest money back. Um, they will not get their due diligence money back. And this kind of leads to a, something that was not asked, but you know, we are getting more and more inquiries about appraisal addendums. And, you know, a lot of buyers are submitting these things with their offers where the buyer is saying, we agree uh, to pay the difference if the property doesn't appraise. And, you know, I've written uh, a Q&A on it. Uh, and it's, you can find it on our website, uh, on, the, on the NC Realtors website. And it's under the title, it's under the, I think it's under appraisal guidance for, for, uh, for agents uh, or guidance for appraisal addenda or something like that. But it's, um, I don't think these, these addendums are worth the paper they're printed on. The, the, what they, because the reality is even if the buyer agrees that they're gonna pay the difference, the truth of the matter is they still have the right during the due diligence period to terminate the contract for any reason or no reason. And if they don't exercise that right during the due diligence period, they still have the ability to breach the contract and not close. And in that case, the, the seller still gets the same thing that they always got. They're not in any way guaranteed that the buyer is gonna buy. You know, there is no remedy of specific performance. The seller can't, cannot force the buyer to pay the money. So um, that's a question that wasn't really asked. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, someone else asked about when, I think they came in late, they asked when the forms went in, you know, went into effect and when they had to be, but someone okay. else answered that. So, okay. um, you know, I think, I think we're good there. I mean, I, I would, uh, I, I know people are seeing all the new forms um, on offers coming in. So, yeah. Well, well I think the changes are good. I really do. I think the changes are good ones. Uh, you know, they're, uh, we'll see how, how everything plays out. So, um, but uh, again, I encourage people with questions about any of this to, uh, to call the legal hotline or, or email us. Um, and I see that somebody put, Ashley, I think put the, uh, the email. Yeah, she, she sent the, the site. Right. So. Very good. The, uh, the email. So thanks, Bill. Really appreciate your time and doing this for us. And hopefully we will be uh, smarter out there. So.